Welcome to Beekeeping Today podcast presented by Bee Culture. Beekeeping Today podcast is your source for beekeeping news, information, and entertainment. I'm Jeff Ott. And I'm Kim Flatham. Hey, Jeff and Kim. Today's sponsor is Global Patties. They're a family-operated business that manufactures protein supplement patties for honeybees. It's a good time to think about honeybee nutrition. Feeding your hives protein supplement patties will ensure that they produce strong and healthy colonies by increasing brood production and overall honey flow. Now is a great time to consider what type of patty is right for your area and your honeybees. Global offers a variety of standard patties as well as custom patties to meet your needs. No matter where you are, Global is ready to serve you out of their manufacturing plants in Airdrie, Alberta and in Butte, Montana or from distribution depots across the continent. Visit them today at www.globalpatties.com. Thanks a lot for your support, Global Patties. Hey, you know everybody, each week we get to talk about how much we appreciate our sponsor support. They help make all of this happen and provide us the ability to bring you each episode. With that, thanks to Bee Culture Magazine for continuing their presenting sponsorship of this podcast. Bee Culture has been the magazine for American beekeeping since 1873. Subscribe to Bee Culture today. And while you're there, check out Bee Culture's Beekeeping Your First Three Years, a quarterly magazine for beginning beekeepers. We also want to thank Two Million Blossoms for their support of this episode. Two Million Blossoms is a quarterly magazine dedicated to protecting all pollinators. Learn more on our Season 2, Episode 9 podcast with editor and our guest co-host, Kirsten Trainer, and from visiting www.2millionblossoms.com, and that is with a number two. Hey, everybody. Thanks for joining us. It's great to see the days get a little bit longer each day, isn't it, Kim? Yeah, it is. You know, before I forget, Jeff, I want to mention one thing about bee culture. They've just released the, the 42nd edition of ABC. And oh, nice. it's a, it's available now. So uh, check out their webpage or look in the magazine or give them a call. Um, I've seen it. It's it's something to behold. I'm looking forward to getting my copy. Uh, it's on order, and uh, boy, it's it's. I've always liked that book, so it's a good one. It's a good one to have on your bookshelf. How are your bees doing? The winter, they got their snow boots on. Yeah. Um, it, it's been a weird winter, and I don't know how they're doing. And uh, actually, this is a, a good time to mention two things, if you if you'll let me. Go one ahead. of them is one of them is the new podcast that we're doing with Jim Two that I'm doing with Jim Two called Honey Bee mm-hmm. Obscura, and it's simply it's going to be a short twenty minute program once a week or so, uh, talking bees, stuff that we yeah. know, stuff that we think we know, uh, and maybe some stuff we don't know. But one of the programs we've already got in the can is midwinter feeding. And and uh, if you go out and your colony is so light you can move it with one hand, you know you got a problem. <laughs> so uh, check out that one. But I- I'm going out right when we're done with this today, Jeff. I'm going out and check mine for food. And it's going to be warm enough, I think, I hope, to pop the top and take a look. But we'll see. Oh, that'll be good. And that's that's great information to have. I know there's probably... I might have a hive or two that if a stiff wind blew, it'd probably just topple it right over. So yep. <laughs> I better, I look forward to that episode. <laughs> so speaking of which, what should uh, beekeepers be doing right now uh, uh, in January? Well, that's cer- that's certainly one thing is is checking the food levels. And, you know, sometimes emergency feeding is, is uh, necessary. I'll tell you a trick that I learned a long time ago, Jeff, if you got a minute. Mm-hmm. It's uh, when I close my colonies up in the fall. I use I use uh, the old spring scale to to uh, weigh my colonies. I'm not in, I'm not technical enough to use the new ones that are out there. Mm-hmm. And I uh, when I close them up in the fall, I write the weight of the colony on the top of the roof. And then when I go back in January, I check the weight again, and I can see how much is gone. And that, that right off the bat gives you a good handle on how much food you got left. Is that you pick it up from the back end with the the spring scale, or do you? You do both. You do the front and the back, and you add them together. Okay. And and if you do it the same way both times, you're gonna get you're gonna get a comparable weight. So it it right off the bat, you you know now the other the downside of that is when the bottom is covered in snow. <laughs> or or frozen but, frozen to the yep. uh, ground. <laughs> Boy, this is a heavy hive. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's good. Uh, and and uh, you you said you heard some uh, 
uh, news about the the almonds. This uh, the bees heading to almonds. Yeah, my source is down um, in the southern, very southern part of California, uh, not too far from San Diego. Are telling me that bees are starting to arrive already. This is uh, early wow. January, and I'm I'm guessing that these are guys who want to get them out of the snow up north. Yeah, or out of the rain in the Pacific Northwest. <laughs> that too. Yes. Yep. Yeah. Well, good. Well, that's good. It's a big time of year for the beekeepers heading to the almond uh, orchards. So that's that's fantastic. We do have uh, a couple things that we've we, we're releasing at, from beekeeping today. We have a new website that should be out again. Uh, we tried to do a release in December and had some technical issues. So. Uh, folks, just keep checking back. We'll have that website up again shortly, as I understand it. Um, not to get into details, but we had to let it rest for a couple, couple, several weeks before we uh, open it back up again. And uh, to to everybody, and uh, but once we do, you'll be able to check out our new website, uh, leave questions and comments directly on the website, and even instead of uh, leaving reviews on, like say Apple podcast, you could leave a review of the show directly on our website. So uh, great, great, more interactive features and I look forward to getting that out and live with everybody. And as we mentioned, you got Honeybee Obscure going? Yep. That'll be there too. And that'll be, we're planning on that, uh, releasing that next week or well, it'll be the week of this podcast. So that should be released the week of the 14th. Yeah, that's what uh, we're aiming for. But you know, it's uh, give or take a week <laughs> <laughs> and 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 we've heard also that uh it it takes a little bit of while for the podcast to get through all the apple podcasts and google play and spotify before it gets populated all out there so if you want to check the honeybee obscure website on a regular basis uh you'll start seeing the podcast show up there before they show up on your regular streaming service It'll be it'll be in uh, the Honeybee Obscura webpage and Beekeeping Today too, won't it, Jeff? Uh, we will provide a link. Link, uh, right? Good. Yeah, we'll provide a link. Very okay. good. And and we're working with Kirsten on the two million blossoms, the podcast. Um, that it will be focused uh, um, some honeybee, but uh, the, the she'll be able to expand a little bit more into the whole pollinator subject. Um, more than uh, she could here on Beekeeping Today podcast, so that's an exciting uh, and a, 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 an exciting podcast for everybody and, and the pollinator oriented. It's a nice mix. The three it of is. Them. It, it, it'd yep. be real good, and and I'm really proud of the work that everyone's doing. Yep. All right, so who do we have coming up on today's show, Kim? Uh, good show, Jeff. Marla Spivak is going to be with us, and she's talking mostly about propolis, but she's got some other other irons in the fire there, too, that she's going to bring up, I think. Oh, that's a topic that'll really stick to you. Oh! oh. I'm sorry. Sorry. All right. With that, <laughs> let's go to Strong Microbials and uh, listen to their entire probiotic line. Hello, beekeepers. Your honeybees face a lot of challenges out there. Unbalanced food sources from monoculture crops, holding yards, drought, food shortages, antibiotics, pesticides, and pathogens like chop brood. To overcome these challenges, your bees need the multiple bacteria that are in all nectars, pollens, and the environment. These bacteria aid honeybees' digestion and improve your honeybees' response and resilience to pesticides. Now you can help improve your honey colony health with a quick, easy, and safe to use product. Strong Microbials Super DFM Honeybee uses naturally occurring bacteria to restore the healthy gut biome of your honeybees. Check them out today at www.strongmicrobials.com. Well, we'd like to welcome Marla Spivak to the Beekeeping Today podcast. Thank you, Marla, for joining us. Thank you for having me. This will be fun. Uh, it's good to see you again, Marla. <laughs> Good to see you too, with your back background of all books behind you. <laughs> I should have guessed the library here, part of the library. Well, thank you, Marla. For those who who don't know you, can you give us a little bit about your background and what you do there at the University of Minnesota? Sure, I'm a professor at the University of Minnesota. I'm in the Department of Entomology, and I study bees, and I have for a very long time. 
I got interested in bees when I was about 18 years old and um, never looked back. Like so many of us. Yeah. And you've, you've received quite a few awards and, and recognitions uh, through your time there, uh, most notably the MacArthur Fellowship. That's pretty prestigious, isn't it? Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> and, 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 and this is, this is the, the most unique one I, I, that you have. A former student of yours named a, a species of sweat bee after you. Oh, that's my, that's my biggest honor of all. <laughs> yeah, so I'm not going to I'm not going to I'm not going to even try and butcher the name. Can you what's the name of the sweat bee? Um it's Dialectus and Spivacath Spivacie or something like that. I don't know how to pronounce it. <laughs> yeah. but it's my last name with a Latin ending, so it's it's good. Yeah, if it's not Smith, I have a hard time with it. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Well, Marla, most m- most of the recent work that's uh um, you've been associated with has to do with Propolis, which is which is looking like it's a, a better and better and better thing for bees, even if it's still sticky for beekeepers. But um, it, it, tell us a little bit about how how that started and where it's going, and and why we need to pay attention. Yeah, I never imagined that I would study propolis. I never really liked the stuff. It's on all my clothes, <laughs> you know, all my shirts, all my everything. But a couple of things happened. I spent a little time in Brazil where they do a lot of studies on propolis. And I was introduced to a lot of stingless bee colonies, which use a lot of resin or propolis in their colonies. And then when I was back in the U.S., uh, some people from the medical school, researchers, we're looking for alternative cures for human HIV. And in lab, in the cell culture, they found that propolis is active against human HIV. And at that point, I just went, okay, this has got to be good for bees. I didn't really know how to study it, except that I went to a, a meeting, a professional me- an entomology society of America meeting. And there, there was a guy talking about um, ants that collect resin spruce resin and how it benefited the ant colony and I looked to my students and went this is it this is what it does we're just gonna do similar methods as what they did with the ants so I should explain a little bit that um, resin for me equals propolis or propolis and I don't know the best way to pronounce propolis or propolis you know (laughs) potato potato I don't know that it really matters but um So there's these plants, some plants produce resin and resin Mm -hmm. protects the plant. It's a it's a plant defense and not all plants produce it. So there are these high, well, beekeepers know they're really, really sticky. And what bees find these plants that produce the resins and they go and scrape the resins off, usually off of the leaves, the leaf buds, for example, and they pack the resin on their hind legs and then fly home. And then they use, once the resin's back in the colony, we call it propolis. They may mix a little <laughs> bit of wax with the resin, but propolis is basically plant resins once they're inside the honeybee colony. So it's not just raw resin. Or, yeah, raw, raw resin. That's hard to say fast. Yeah, um, it is raw. They might have wax, pollen, and... It can be raw resin. <laughs> they don't... Okay. Bees, bees don't modify it. They don't put, um, other than a little wax, they don't put chemical secretions in it, so they're not modifying the chemistry of the plant resin itself. Interesting. So the plant resin, the plants are producing these resins to pr- to protect themselves from other creatures eating them and and other diseases and pests and whatever. So it's a good thing for the plant and the bee just is kind of taking advantage of that. Exactly. So these resins are really antimicrobial, but they also protect, so they protect the plant from diseases, but they also protect plants from being eaten by a, by um, herbivorous other insects or animals. And it protects the plant from UV light. So they're providing a lot of functions. And then the bees are tapping into the same plant defense and using it for their own defense. Well, I know that that once once the uh, propolis gets back to the hive, then the bees begin to 
do lots of different things with it. And I, I got to do a quick aside here for a second. One of the things that I found this summer, when I work a colony and I get propolis on my fingers and they're sticky, the, 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 the incredible use of hand sanitizers this year because of the COVID, that stuff works wonderful on taking propolis off your fingers. <laughs> Oh, that's, that's good to know. <laughs> well, so you're the reason why there's a, a hand sanitizer shortage in Medina, Ohio. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> well, it works. I, and I, did, I discovered it by accident. And, and uh, I'll just pass that along. But how do be, bees aren't doing it for COVID, obviously, in the, in the interior of their nest? Maybe, well, okay. maybe it's the bee COVID, whatever that is. <laughs> no, they're... They're bringing in for many reasons. They they use it as cement, right? So they use it to kind of caulk up all kinds of cracks and crevices. In in a bee colony, they put it everywhere where we where it gets in our way, right? Under the frame rests, between boxes, so that you have to use your hive tool to pry apart boxes. Sometimes it's very difficult, very sticky. They use it to reduce the size of the entrance, often in late summer. So anywhere where there's a crack in, or a crevice that's less than about a quarter inch, they just love to plug those up with propolis. So it's it's a structural thing. Um, it may help waterproof the hive when they were living in tree cavities, but we've been looking at the antimicrobial properties of it. So what does it do for bee health? Does it do anything for the health of the bees themselves? Are there uh, propolis specialists in the hive and, and collecting it? Because we've we've seen so many specialist water carriers and every, is there are there specialists for propolis gathering? Right. Well, so this was some research that was done by a postdoc that worked with um, Tom Seeley years ago, not so long ago in the nineties. So Tom Seeley ex- described from the feral colonies that he looked at in the upper up, upstate New York in the Arnott Forest. He found inside these tree cavities, they always had the, this lining of propolis all the way around the colony. And, and then a postdoc was looking at who are the bees that bring in these resins and where do they put them? And they're nectar and pollen foragers. They just switch off for part of the day or part of their for, you know part of the time and collect these resins. Bees don't mm-hmm. eat the resin. It's important to know right. that the trees that produce them are not nectar and usually not nectar and pollen producing plants. So they're going making special trips for this sticky stuff. And um, once a bee has it on her legs, she she can't usually get it off herself. Another bee has to help pull it off of her back legs. And you can imagine what a mess it all is. <laughs> sticky inside. And then they that bee that helps pull it off and the foraging bee then just start plugging it into these cracks and crevices. So it's the cracks and crevices on the inside of this natural cavity in a tree that bees are living in. And and they're just making this shell uh, that they're encased in. But why don't they do that in my hive? Because the boxes are smooth. They're plain smooth. So if we had unfinished lumber inside our boxes or or just think about the inside of a tree cavity, how crevicey, how, how many cracks and crevices there are there and how deep the grooves are. You know, if, if that was what the inside of our bee boxes looked like, the bees would build this propolis envelope like they do naturally in a tree cavity. Should our boxes look mm-hmm. like the inside of a tree cavity? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, they don't have to be quite that. I think we're we're doing some research right now. And one of my students is looking at how how much resin is enough. You know, if we give them a rough box, or we're working with a guy who mills his own lumber, and he's he's um, he's put in these kind of grooves, quarter inch grooves that are very rough textured all through the inside of the box. And is that enough to see the same effects that we've seen? in other experiments when we were measuring the health of bees. So we're looking at how much is enough and we, we hope to have results soon. Well, I know in, in, um, in New Zealand, propolis is a viable crop for the beekeeper and they use propolis traps 
And some of them are even yeah. lining the walls of their hives with these propolis traps. And then they, they're easy to remove and then they freeze them and then just break the propolis out of them. Should I be doing that? Sure. <laughs> yes, you should. So <laughs> propolis is great for human health. It has, you know, I really can't go into all of the if benefits it has for human health. But, um, you know, you can make a tincture out of it. Some people make salves for wounds, healing, mm -hmm. and tinctures for sore throat and for oral gum diseases, things like that. Um, but yeah, if you, we've cut up propolis traps, they're kind of expensive, but if we cut up propolis traps and fit them, staple them inside of the walls of the colony, and the bees will then fill it up with propolis, we just leave them in there. Um, you, you can't really put it on all four walls because it's hard to get the frames out that way. You know, that it runs into the side of the frames. Um, so at least three of them, for example, the front one, because that will cover, get toward the entrance and two side walls. If you use a propolis trap and you put it on top of the colony, which is normally how it's used, you know, the bees don't like light coming in or air drafts coming in. So if you put the propolis trap flat on top of the top box of your colony under your cover, they will fill that with propolis. But it's important not to leave that on for the winter because it does block moisture. That's not where the bees are putting it naturally. And then you prop the lid open just a little bit to let some light in. Yeah. Right. Well, right. The, 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 of course, the question is, am I sacrificing something else in the colony to have these bees collecting propolis and spreading propolis? And am I, are they not making honey? Are they not collecting pollen? Are they not taking care of the kids? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, they're just bringing in some medicine. They're just going <laughs> off to the pharmacy. Just some of them, not all of them. But we are doing some studies. Um, I'm working in collaboration with Mike Simone Finstrom down at the Baton Rouge USDA lab. And he's running some large-scale experiments with commercial beekeeper on uh, colonies that have a propolis envelope. They're using rough interior boxes. And they're, half the apiary has these rough boxes and half not. And then they're comparing honey production across many apiaries. And I, as far as I know, the results from this summer, this 2020 summer, which showed there was no difference in honey production. They, it doesn't take away from that. Okay. Well, there are some some races of bees that I'm 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 told I've never I've never looked at it close. But some races of bees are much more productive at at collecting and using propolis than others. Is, uh, is that correct? Yeah, Caucasian bees, which we don't really have here in the United States. Well, Sue Kobe and um, um, Steve Shepard in Washington State have imported some semen from Caucasian stock. And um, I have a few of those queens and I'll be looking at them more next summer coming up to see how those colonies, uh, co if they co really collect a lot of propolis. Africanized bees are really good propolis collectors. They, they just love the stuff. Well, I'll <laughs> probably pass on that one. <laughs> <laughs> I remember that it was for, for a long time, um, low propolis buildup was a, a desired trait, but now it sounds like it's a trait that we want to maybe right. see back again. Yes, I think we've made a mistake. I think in all of all these years where we just didn't like bees that gummed up the works <laughs> and gum, you know, <laughs> got all over our clothes, the bees are bringing it in for a reason, and it really benefits their immune system. That mm -hmm. measure that effect. Um, if we challenge a colony with chalk brood or American foul brood, in other words, we give them a little bit of the disease. <laughs> um, if they have a propolis envelope inside the nest, they it doesn't cure the disease, but it really brings the disease load down. So they don't get such a severe infection. Another uh, research we've just published uh, two different studies is are on the effects of propolis on the bees microbiome. So one of them was with Renata Borba and Mike Simon Finstrom and another guy, Celao from, uh, I think, Brazil, uh, from the Baton Rouge lab he was working. And they found that bees in a colony with a propolis envelope, they have more abundant core microbacteria. So the bacteria that grow naturally in the gut of these, um, they call it the, the core microbiome. That's more abundant mm -hmm. when they have um, a propolis envelope. And, and then the other opportunistic and 
pathogenic bacteria that you might find in the gut, they're lower. They don't have as many. And it was the same. One of my students, Holly Waldallenberg, just finished her master's. And, and she we worked with Kirk Anderson at the other USDA lab in Tucson. And she looked at just the mouth parts, which was fascinating. This was Kirk's idea. So bees get their mouths into everything, right? Their proboscis, <laughs> their tongue. They put it in flowers. They come back to the colony. They share food. They put clean out combs. They feed the queen. So they're getting their mouth parts into everything. And so we looked at the mouth part microbiome because there's microbiome not only in the gut, it's on the bee and on their mouth parts. And it, so colonies with the propolis envelope, it was the same thing. The core microbiome, bacterial microbiome on the mouth parts was more abundant. And they had much fewer pathogenic and opportunistic bacteria on the mouth parts. So they were cleaner mouth parts <laughs> and, and housed a better microbiome, more abundant microbiome. Well, it sounds like a win-win. Yeah, I was going to say, it sounds like a, it's a, a fix, not a fix for everything, but sure is a healthy thing for, for, right. the, for a colony. And they're, and, and they're so stressed these days. Right. Um, or maybe I'm projecting, but it's, you know, that's, it's, everything is uh, like, everyone talks about the colonies and the colony collapse and everything, but here's a, a something that might help towards the overall health of a colony. Right. It, you know, it, it, um, some beekeepers ask me, does it, will it move the needle? Will it move the needle? <laughs> and what, and I'm not sure, you know, it's not the cure all for everything, right. but I think it provides a good foundation for bee health. And, and that propolis is kind of like an exterior immune system or an exterior part of the colony. It's vital to them to keep the hive cavity, the nest cavity, free of all these other bacteria and other um, microbes that might get in there. If you think about the inside of a tree cavity, it's got to be full of bacteria and fungi. And we haven't even mm -hmm. looked at fungi yet. So, Well, this explains very well why an errant mouse in the bottom of the hive is found in the spring encased in this stuff. Right. So it's two serve two purposes, right? It's sticky and it's a cement and you can just entomb the, the mouse, but also because it's antimicrobial, the bacteria will, it'll stop the growth of the bacteria. So, you know, you, I think pharaohs were entombed in propolis and honey, Egyptian pharaohs. Well, that doesn't sound like a bad way to go, I think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's going to be a wow. strange request well, in my will to uh, entomb me propolis. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to need a billion bees here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, also going on in your lab, uh, Marla, I understand that you're starting up a uh, some sort of a breeding program. Yeah, you know, I'm I'm about five years away from retiring, and so I decided I'm going to go for it. We had bred bees for hygienic behavior um, years ago, and that was I thought pretty successful. Um, but I thought I would try something new, and the way, um, the best way I can explain it is I'm going to follow the bees' lead. So I have a set of colonies where I won't treat them but I have their mother colonies. So I have the parent colonies that those little colonies were made from. Okay, so we have these colonies and I'm measuring the parent colonies for all kinds of characteristics. The mite, Varroa mite growth over the season, their hygienic behavior, their propolis collection. So I have all this information about the parents. We make splits or divides from those parents and the splits we're not treating. So the splits that survive our winter, then I can go back to the parent and figure out what characteristics those colonies have and why possibly were they surviving when others weren't. So a lot of people do survivor stock, but we never mm -hmm. know the reason why they survive. So this is me trying to follow the bees lead, letting them, some of them go as survivor stock, but I wanna know where they're leading me. So I'm keeping the parents as a hmm. reference. Does that make sense? That makes very good sense, yes. And surviving a Minnesota winter is, got a, is a task and a half anyway. Yes. So <laughs> if you can get them through that. 
<clears throat> having grown up about about 50 miles due east of yeah. you, um, I'm very familiar with, and glad I'm not living in anymore, that kind of winter. Oh, come on, you chicken. Yeah, you just, put, <laughs> just kidding. You just put on more clothes. <laughs> <laughs> what are you starting as your, uh, your base stock? What will you be using? Oh, I have many that? different, I have many different colonies. So some of them are just from beekeepers that are local. Mm-hmm. So they've been raising local queens in Minnesota. Um, I did get some from Steve Shepard from Washington State University. He's got a stock of bees that he hasn't treated in a long time. Some of the Caucasians uh, from there also. Um, I have some pole line from Baton Rouge Lab that Mm -hmm. is another version of the VSH line, a different one. So I have a mixture of things and some from just, yeah, just a mixture. And I'm not paying attention to race or color or anything. I just want them to survive. Well, it sounds like a pretty big, how many colonies are you talking about here about? Well, let's see. So there's probably not quite a hundred nukes that were wintering. Ooh. And then there's another 50 or so parent colonies and we're just getting going. So it'll, it's pretty, there's a fair number of colonies. Yeah. I, I guess. Yeah. Yes. Get your work cut out for you. Yeah. It's fun. Well, I have to ask, right? That kind of leads me into this perfect question here. Your chief beekeeper yeah. uh, at the lab there, Gary, he's, is he, uh, he's, he's, he's going to be stepping back, I understand. Yes. Gary Ruder is going to retire on January 14th, and it's going to be a very sad day, but uh, probably a really happy day for him. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so Gary, Gary has worked with me in at the University of Minnesota since 1994, I believe. When I moved there, first thing I did was hire him. And um, you know, he's every I had everything, all my accomplishments really are I owe to Gary because he's just done so much. So we're, you know, I'll think of ideas and then he'll actually figure out a way to implement them. He's my devil's advocate all the time, which I really appreciate. So I'll pitch an idea and he argues whether he agrees with my idea or not. He'll, he'll argue with me. Sometimes we get arguing so, so much it stare, scares our graduate students. <laughs> <laughs> but it's friendly. They're friendly. They're friendly arguments. They're just trying to poke holes in the ideas until we're finally in, in agreement and we think, okay, maybe we can run an experiment like this. He's extremely, extremely talented um, beekeeper, but also he can make anything, all kinds of special mm. bee equipment and gadgets and gizmos. And um, he's funny. He's extremely funny. He gives talks that beekeepers are, you know, they just come just to listen to Gary. And you know, our routine together is, you know, I might, I'm kind of rolling my eyeball, eyeballs, you know, I'm the straight cop and he's, he's the, he's the funny one. And um, I don't know, but he, um, he lives on a farm with his wife. And during this time of sheltering in place, he said, you know what, this has been nice staying home more often. Um, I think he and Ginger, his wife, he realized how much they love being together and you know he's he has a million hobbies so i think he's going to be super happy well it's good to hear i i know i've known him uh for a long time we grew up very close to each other mm-hmm. uh back in the day so uh i i've always been able to kind of keep tabs on you through yeah. him uh see what you you you're being up to so well it's good that he's uh getting away Bad that you you won't have him anymore, but uh, all things considered, well, we know a good we deal. know where he lives. Yeah, <laughs> telephone call Gary. How do I, you know he's got so much job security? Actually, I told him to please before he leaves to write like a manual of where everything is and everything that he does. So he's calling it his dissertation. He's writing a how-to manual for, like, how to unlock paper towel dispensers and how to, you know, (laughs) et cetera. 
They made me do the same thing when I left, so I I can understand that. Yeah, where do you hide? Where do you hide the keys to the restroom and that sort of thing? Right. Right. Well, the other thing I know that that comes out of your lab, and I, I'm going to guess Gary was a part of this anyway, but but not running it is the B Squad. Yeah, that started. That was this idea that started around uh, 2012. You know, there's just been so much interest in backyard beekeeping. And I couldn't keep up, and Gary and I couldn't keep up. So we thought together, what if we start something like, I don't know where we came up with the name Bee Squad, but I know in my head I had something envisioned like the Geek Squad, where we would drive around in these <laughs> cute little cars with antennae and wings, and you know, we would wear whatever weird bee costumes. And if people needed help with their bees, we could drive out and help them. But this is where Gary comes in. We, we together <laughs> sat down and drew up a business plan and just realized there's no way we can afford that. We would have to charge people so much money just to drive around in the cars. So eventually the B-Squad evolved into kind of the outreach and extension arm of the B-Lab. So they run all kinds of programs and I'll just let them talk to you about all the many things they're doing. And it's really... Uh, it's just gone beyond my wildest dreams. I this vision I had to begin with is nowhere where <laughs> near where it's at right now. Well, we're going to be talking to them, Jeff. Who's the who's the person we're talking to? On the well, the B new squad? captain of the B squad is Bridget Mendel. So the original was Jody okay. Gertz, who's now living in Australia, and then Becky Masterman was the one who took it in. I think about well, I forget what year, two thousand twelve, I guess, and for many years ran it, grew it. And then, um, so she's she still helps out part time, but she handed it over to Bridget. Yeah, we are scheduled to okay. talk to Bridget here pretty soon, and the episode be out second week of February or okay. so. Yeah, that so- sounds good. Yeah. Well, what else, what else have we missed at the University of Minnesota, Marla? Well, you know, we have a new facility as of 2016. And there's two professors in the building, the Bee Lab. It's me and Dan Caravo, who is a native bee ecologist. And then the Bee Squad's in there. And so it's kind of cool because we're honeybees, native bees in one facility, trying to accommodate and make sure that all bees are taken care of. So it's not just honeybees. We're trying to understand how we can provide more habitat for native bees or is there pathogen spillover from honeybees into our native bees when they visit the same flowers? Um, so together we're doing other studies that, you know, we have Elaine Evans um, does extension work, outreach work on bumblebees in the lab. So it's really a vibrant lab when when we're there. Right now we're mostly working from home. <laughs> yeah. I know when I was there a few years ago, you were, there was, I think, one whole greenhouse devoted to bumblebees. You were doing, I, I don't recall the experiment, but uh, a lot of bumblebees were Right, there. yeah, so Elaine's been rearing a lot of bumblebee colonies for different kinds of experiments. If you go out to the your website, and we'll put the link in the show notes, but uh, the amount of work and presence you have and the work you're doing on honeybees is amazing. It's really fun to go through and learn a lot just by reading through your web- website. So kudos to you and your team. Thank Fantastic. You. Yeah. All right. Hey, well, Marla, is there anything else you'd like to add in closing? I think I would tell people, even though this is, I'm not a medical physician, I am not a human doctor, but, um, you know, if you get a little propolis tincture extract and you put some drops of propolis in your tea with honey, I think it would be a <laughs> I think it would be a good thing. I'm not saying it's a cure for anything, but it, it tastes good. And it, and it can't be bad for you, all the things that you've sung about it here today. No, it's, it, it's good for so, you. It's, it's good. It won't hurt good. you. So if you can't, you know, because of COVID, a lot of people are hesitant to go into the dentist, you know. So if you have a, yeah. a, a tooth infection or anything, you definitely put propolis on it for that. And you can get it off your hands with a with a COVID hand cleaner. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> I was surprised at how well it worked. <laughs> well, Dr. Marla Spivak, we've definitely enjoyed having you on the show today. We look forward to having you back. 
and and looking forward to talking to your compatriots from the B Squad. And that'll be out in the first couple weeks of February. You take care. And give Gary a pat in the back for us. I, I will. Uh, I probably won't pat him on the back because I can't get within six feet of him. <laughs> but, <laughs> um, but I will give him my re- your regard. Thank you Good. so much. And thanks for having me. You bet. You know, I really enjoyed and had been looking forward to getting Dr. Marla Spivak on on, on the show. Uh, you know, I met her when we went to the ABF meeting back in way, way back in 1993 in Kansas City, and I met her there and have been uh, just following her progress and and all of her TED talks and everything she's done since then. That's it's she's I'm happy to have had her on the show. Yeah, you know. Uh... The simple rule in beekeeping, if it's good for the bee, it's probably not good for the beekeeper. And if it's good for the beekeeper, it's probably not good for the bees. I think mm-hmm. she just proved that in spades this time. It's, uh, you know, propolis is the, just in the way every time you open up a beehive. But without it, bees would be in trouble or at least more trouble. Yeah. You know, it's a really amazing in the last several years how the the perception or the desire for propolis has evolved and changed uh, it used to be, as we talked, uh, something that you had abhorred, abhorred and, and, and did away with and hated and did everything to keep bees from and, and, and pretty, putting down propolis. And now it's like, well, I, I want some there. I, I wanna, I'm going to rough up the inside of my colony just so that they lay down some, some propolis. Yeah. Have you ever used that plastic propolis trap that she talked about? No, you know, I, I didn't because I started in a time when collecting propolis was to sell and I never had a market for selling for propolis. So I never even experimented with it. Yeah. It's, and there's not, it's, it's not a, it's not a huge market here either. I know down the desert Southwest there is some, but there's contamination with pesticides and antibiotics almost everywhere. And so Mm -hmm. large scale, large scale sales of it, um, haven't, haven't evolved very much but when I was in New Zealand, I think every beekeeper had at least a couple of colonies with propolis traps on them, and and it was a big market. It was a you know a, a profitable sideline for a beekeeper. You add a propolis along with uh, pollen, and you add to your honey and wax yep. product. Yep. Really good. Well, well I think thing, we can. The other thing that uh, I liked it and I, I hadn't heard about I had heard that she was doing some uh, breeding but I wasn't sure mm. I wouldn't didn't know how evolved the program was and and this is interesting because it's it's not fine-tuning a breed it is it is taking bees and getting them adjusted to their environment mm-hmm. um, the, the letting nature select. Tom Seeley talks about it in his books, and and this is kind of how she's looking at this. Also, is is nature decides, and I'm I, I hope I'm around long enough to get some of those bees. Yeah, I found it interesting too because there's a lot of discussion in the popular press and media and, and beekeeping meetings about natural selection and everything. Uh, but there's, you know, I'm sure there's some research, but it, there's not a whole lot of recent research. It doesn't seem, and it, it's good to see that. Uh, Marla is putting time and energy and resources into studying the subject and, and hopefully producing a uh, usable report that uh, has meaningful information. Yeah, she's giving treatment free a professional look, um, yeah. a let alone beekeeping. And what's going to come out of it is what a lot of people who are practicing this now are trying to get. She's just doing it on a really big scale. I'm looking forward to having her back and having her discuss her research. All right. Well, that about wraps it up with this episode with Dr. Marla Spivak. Hope you enjoyed it. Before we go, I want to encourage our listeners to rate us five stars on Apple Podcasts or even now our, our website or wherever you download and stream the show. Your vote helps other beekeepers find us quicker. Even better, write a review and let other beekeepers looking for a new podcast know what you like. As always, we thank Bee Culture, the magazine for American beekeeping, for their continued support of Beekeeping Today podcast. We want to thank our regular episode sponsor, Global Patties. Check them out at www.globalpatties.com. We also want to thank Strong Microbials for becoming the latest supporter of the podcast. Check out their probiotic line at www.strongmicrobials.com. 
And finally, we want to thank you, the Beekeeping Today podcast listener, for joining us on this show. Feel free to send us questions and comments at questions at Beekeeping Today podcast. We'd love to hear from you. And I want to add, you can even leave a, leave a voicemail comment on our new website. Anything else you want to mention, Kim? Well, I was just going to ask if you're going to stick around for a while, Jeff. Oh. oh. <laughs> We'll see you next time. Take care.